down to music and coins. And if I could take the liberty of being uh, an organizer, <laughs> I'm going to shift gears completely because I'm not an expert either in music or coins. And so I will, instead of, um, instead of commenting, I'm going to um, make a feeble connection, attempt to connect these two totally different. composed to celebrate the British victory in the Opium War in 1842. And Zhi Ping will present his research on, an, on the ancient coins seen on the two large scrolls in this project. So these are the remaining two units in depicting glory. Um, so to make a feeble attempt to make the connection between these two, why we put these two objects in the depicting glory, both the sheet music and the coin scrolls are products of the mid and late 19th century, respectively. And this is a century bisected in the middle by China's loss in the Opium War. From that loss onward, the Qing government was beset by a series of rebellions, each contributing to the, to the waning that each really contributing to pushing the waning dynasty to its demise. So, and as we've just seen in the previous panels, the Qing government, um, in its desperation to rebound from its humiliating loss in the Opium War, and aware that it needed to overcome public doubt about its strength, portrayed its efforts to put down these rebellions as grand victories, reminiscent of the military might in the High Qing. But it would be Great Britain that would celebrate an unequivocal victory in the Opium War. The sheet music that Laura is going to discuss momentarily is little known or thoroughly unknown, uh, part of the British celebration. Laura approaches a study of this music from a musicologist's point of view. Hers will most likely be the first study of this unique piece of music. The Qing's loss in the Opium War also spurred a series of reforms in the second half of the 19th century. One of the main aspects of these reforms is teaching and learning European languages, especially English. Um, our digital project includes a set of three extra long scrolls with bilingual um, Chinese-English titles. These are most probably products of such reform efforts. One scroll compares Chinese pictographs with Egyptian hieroglyphs, and two other scrolls showcase coins throughout Chinese history. So our second presenter, Ding Zhiping, while a student at Brown, chose to study the two coins scrolls because since childhood he is a coins collector. So um, these two uh, panelists will share with us what they found. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Sushing, and thank you to Joe and to Jen and to Dawn, wherever she went, for everything that went into organizing this symposium. The Emperor of China's Band March is a musical work that offers a fictional version of the end of the First Opium War, a version in which the British presence in China is welcomed and celebrated by the Chinese emperor. This piano piece not only created an imaginary positive relationship between Great Britain and the Chinese emperor for a British audience, but also instructed the British music consumer in what we would now call an Orientalist view of China. Let's look at the object itself, maybe. There it is. The brown copy of this work includes a title page with lithograph and five pages of music. The probable date of publication is 1843. On the cover page, we see a number of names, which is typical for 19th century sheet music. The music is by Albert Keller, a London-based composer and music pedagogue who was particularly active in creating minstrel tune arrangements. 
The image by British lithographer John Brandard is called the Treaty of Peace between Great Britain and China. The march is dedicated to Sir Henry Pottinger, who became the governor of newly British Hong Kong in 1843. And you won't be able to see my last box, um, but the publisher is the London firm of Leonie Lee, which had an official relationship with Queen Victoria and which published a number of musical works with titles about China and India, or as they called it, Hindustan. I'd like to spend a few moments on this cover image before turning to the music. The title refers to the Treaty of Nanjing, the treaty which ended the First Opium War and handed Hong Kong over to the British. The illustration does not accurately depict the event of the signing of the treaty, however, which occurred on a warship. Uh, Brandard, the artist, was a prolific lithographer who created illustrations for hundreds of sheet music covers and books. Um, we can talk about that more in the Q&A, but to, to sum up, his work abounds in political, military, and patriotic themes very strongly pro-British. The Treaty of Peace between Great Britain and China shows two group, groups of men, one in imagined Chinese dress and uh, the other in Western military dress garb. The Chinese group does not carry weapons, and a parasol floats over the central figure, understood to be the emperor. This figure stands on a low platform, indicating his elevated status in comparison with the other Chinese figures, but not elevating him to an impressive extent. There is a feather in his hat, suggesting a somewhat foppish personage, um, and he holds a long scroll of paper, likely supposed to be the treaty itself. And his hands are positioned such that he appears to be proffering the treaty to one of the Westerners. The foregrounded men in Western garbs appear in formal uniforms and carry swords, and British soldiers with fixed bayonets can be seen in the background. The contrast of the parasol on the Chinese side and the weapons on the British side fits with a more general trend toward what scholar Hao Gao has called a feminization of China in the English imagination. End quote. This is enhanced by the agreeable, inviting expression on the emperor's face. Turning to the music. In spite of what one might assume from the title, the Emperor of China's Band March probably was not performed in China in the 19th century, and it may never have been intended for performance by a band. Um, I have not found any evidence that performing parts for this work ever existed. Um, instead, the music falls into the genre known as descriptive piano fantasias, um, which were common in the 19th century. Um, so understanding the descriptive piano fantasia is key to understanding what is happening in the music, um, and I know there aren't a lot of musicologists in this audience, so I put the definition on the slide. Um, so musicologists Helena Goldberg and Jonathan, Jonathan D. Bellman define such works as, quote, a commercially successful genre of episodically constructed narrative pieces for the piano, characterized by the presence of brief verbal descriptions appearing throughout the scores as subtitles or captions. So, in this genre, the form of the music is demarcated by written descriptions found in the score, and the Emperor of China's Band March abounds in descriptive markers. And these are just a couple of examples from the score, and how you see them you know, embedded into the progress of the music. The descriptive markers, overall, create a picture of an approaching military band. The markers also distinguish the sonorities associated with different band instruments, and thus suggest aspects of how the piece should be performed by the pianist. And the full list of descriptors is as follows. So it starts with band at a distance, I can't see all of it, band at a distance with soft pedal on, then you take the soft pedal off, drums and fife, giacoso, a bugle at a distance, and drums and fife, a bugle this time con fuoco with force, so the bugle has gotten closer to you, a trumpet, and then a trumpet più stretto, so the trumpet is kind of getting faster and more forceful as it moves closer to the end. Over the course of the entire piece, the approach of the band is signaled by both the descriptive markers and the gradual in intensification of dynamic levels. So it starts with at piano with um, soft pedal on soft piano um, in musical language, to at the beginning to fortissimo, uh, that's three Fs, which translates to very, very loud at the end. <laughs> um, so there, there is this sort of sonic approach of the band toward you. 
The instruments specified in the descriptions further clarify that in the imaginary sonic world of this march, Western instruments are being played by British musicians for an imperial Chinese audience. Within the context of the descriptive Fantasia genre, uh, the Emperor of China's band march is in a fairly conventional march form, so A, B, A prime. And the harmonic language is also unadventurous by mid 19th century Anglo European standards. The compound duple meter, which is 6 8, uh, pardon me, may be a component of the imaginary sonic relationship between the British band players and the Chinese emperor. So in 6 8, each measure has two beats that are sub further subdivided into three parts. So it goes one and uh, two and uh, one and uh, two. And, uh, um, and in this case, the basic rhythmic figure of the march is this quarter note, eighth note, so it's like one and uh, two and uh, two. Um, that, that is what that sounds like um, when you're actually performing it. So the significance of this is that each step of the march would be accompanied by a rhythmic figure that we could call jaunty. In other words, this is a joyous, almost dancing march. It suggests a celebratory atmosphere for the imagined signing of the Treaty of Nanjing, in which a British military band creates a sonic world that is jubilant and completely Western. The technical level of this work is not terribly high. It could be performed by an intermediate piano student without too much difficulty. A person listening to this work would not necessarily know that the descriptive markers were there, uh, this suggests that the primary audience for this piece was the performers themselves, their instructors, and perhaps other members of the performer's household, since such a piece would likely have been performed in a domestic setting. This piano work and its cover art together epitomize the phenomenon of Orientalism as applied to China. As Edward Said put it, quote, Orientalism is more a sign of European Atlantic power over the Orient than it is a veridic discourse about the Orient." End quote. The Emperor of China's Band March is about an imagined China and Chinese emperor for a British audience. Lacking veracity, it instead suggests how a British home audience might have wished to imagine the signing of the Treaty of Nanjing. In addition, the relatively novice technical level suggests a youth audience, piano students. Thus, the cultural impact of this work is pedagogical on multiple levels, not only an exercise in piano technique, but also an exercise in how British consumers were to think about the First Opium War, the British takeover of Hong Kong, and the power imbalance between Britain and China. The predominant mood of British triumphalism and the apparent Chinese acceptance of British influence that is portrayed on the cover discourages the performer from consideration of any ethical problems underlying the British decision to fight the First Opium War. The favoring of a triumphal mood over consideration of ethical issues is a component of the imperialist mindset. This piano work in a small way feeds into that mindset. The imperialist mindset is intertwined here with the commercial mindset. In this case, the patriotic and even jingoistic impulse on both the visual and oral levels is packaged into a tidy, saleable commodity. A more nuanced musical and artistic take on the First Opium War might have been a more difficult sell. The relative ease and visual appeal of such a work masks the way in which it normalizes British political and military dominance of China to the performer and to the domestic audience. The Treaty of Nanjing was a definitive moment in the trajectory of British-Chinese relations, as Zhu Qing has just mentioned. It launched a period of unequal treaties and foreign imperialism that continued until 1997 with the return of Hong Kong to Chinese rule. In 1843, a treaty that signaled a crushing defeat for China had to be marketed to the British population as cause for celebration and a move toward peace in their relations with the Chinese. Brown's, Brown University's copy of the Emperor of China's Band March is but one example of the cultural slash commercial artifacts that played a role in creating a particular understanding of British-Chinese relations for the British home audience, an understanding that placed a high value on British commercial success in the increasingly global market 
and that normalized imperial conquest as part of that success. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So my name is Zhi Ping, a Brown class of 2022 alumnus who studied economics and archaeology. Um, as a student at Brown, I have been working as a East Asian collection since my freshman year. So I have participated in the analysis of uh, some of the archives there, including the battlefield uh, scene painting and the coin scroll, which I will be sharing my experience in, in dating this today. So this is um, the title of one of the coin scroll called the or Chinese coins, uh, so an, it's ancient Chinese coins um, in its English translation title. Um, to begin with, um, these two set of scrolls was, um, were digitalized in around fall 2019. Um, the two scrolls apparently displayed um, the illustration of antiquarian Chinese coins. One of the first things that I've noticed about the scroll is the uneven application of the ink throughout. For instance, you can see that the shade of the spade coins right here, it's apparently painted by hand, since uh, the shade here and the shade here is just uh, similar, but it shows some minute differences. And if you uh, focus on the handwritten character here, you can find uh, similar patterns. Uh, for, for instance, the shape of the coins are kind of similar, but there are still differences like in the shape and how um, the circle has been drawn by the artist. So, so these details indicate a manual production process of these scrolls, uh, which is a work of Chinese brush. And I am a, um, a Chinese calligrapher, so I identify this rather straightforwardly. Uh, the second distinct feature, uh, uh, feature I've noticed is that on the scroll titled Chinese Coin by Dynasty, they present a coin catalog by dynasties, wherein the last dynasty it mentioned is Ming, but not the Qing Dynasty, which is actually the last Chinese dynasty. This feature indicates that the scroll was produced before the Qing's collapse in 1911. So, uh, um, so this gave us the terminus antiquam or the time before which. And as you can see, um, it actually blocked here. So after Ming, there is called, uh, this is also titled Ming, and this is called ancient coins, but there's no Qi, which is the actual last dynasty of China. Also, at the same time, the epigraph of the other scroll, Ancient Chinese Coins, have a sentence that, that is identical to one found in an earlier book compiled in 1864, which is so from An Tong Zhi to, the, to around here. So half of this epigraph has been quoted from a 1864 book. So from this, we can determine the earliest uh, possible point that this scroll is created, which is 1864. So we know that um, this coin must have been created in the uh, late Qing period or around 1860s to the 1910s. Looking into the details of the scroll Chinese coin by dynasty, I find that this form of coin cataloging was more dynasty focused instead of coin focused. To be specific, Chinese coin catalogs tend to group coins by their titles or types, accompanied by additional descriptive information pertaining to the coins. However, this coin scroll, which uh, at the Brown's library, um, uh, presented limited attention to individual point, but instead focused on presenting a complete list of Chinese dynasties. For instance, from here, it says Tang, Yao, Yu, Shun, and then the Xia dynasty, the Shang dynasty, the Zhou dynasty, uh, and then Qin, Han. So until the Ming and 
and Yuan and the Ming. So it, it provides us a list of the dynasties rather than a description or a catalog of the coin per se. Um, to my own understanding, as the coin scroll was produced in the late Qing, which is a time when the empire faced decline challenges, this established line of dynasty may be an attempt to legitimize the Qing within an unbroken lineage of Chinese dynasty history. This emphasis on lineage originates from the Confucian ideology, which is the Chinese national ideology. Uh, moreover, I also noted that two coins illustrated in the catalog that were particularly controversial in relation to conventional practice at that time. So one of them is titled Jianwen Tongbao, which is issued by Ming Dynasty Emperor Jianwen or Zhu Yunwen. Um, the Ming Dynasty Jianwen had been overthrown four years after, he, uh, after his coronation. His successor, Zhu Di, ordered all official documents carrying the, ring, the, the renal title Jianwen to be destroyed, including this coin. Uh, the Emperor Jianwen was officially reinstated as a legitimate emperor only 400 years later uh, during the reign of Qing Emperor Kangxi. However, topics pertaining to Emperor Jianwen had been remained controversial, and his coin had been very moderately circulated in the course of the history, if they had been circulated at all. And I believe that the only reason to include this controversial coin, a coin is to maintain a clear lineage between emperors within a dynasty, in addition to the continuity of the lineage across the di dynasty presented in, the, in this dynastic-centric uh, catalog. Um, the second controversial coin is titled the Coin of Great Ming, or Da Ming Tongbao. It's actually not um, casted by the Ming Dynasty, but the Southern Ming Dynasty. Um, the Southern Ming is established in Nanjing after the, uh, by the remaining Ming royal house after their defeat by the Manchus, who later founded the Qing Dynasty uh, with a capital in Beijing. And Southern Ming had been long considered a elite and very illegal regime by the Qing court, uh, in which people with ties to the Southern Ming regime have uh, always been severely prosecuted. Despite this, Han ethnic Chinese scholars um, serving the Qing court were generally very sympathetic to this regime, given that their rulers were Manchus. As the Qing Dynasty coin catalog tend to either omit the Southern Ming coins or to group them with other coins produced by illegal emperors and illegal regimes, um, our scroll legit, uh, legitimized this, uh, this coin and included it with the rest of, rest of the Ming Dynasty coins. So this is very, very rare given that the scroll was produced in the Qing Dynasty. I believe that this admission of the South Southern Ming coin highlights the Qing ruler's effort to win over the loyalty of Confucian scholars uh, who are sympathetic to the Southern Ming and to ease the internal conflict between the Han ethnic and, um, and Manchu ethnic Chinese subjects. Um, as previously introduced, the late Qing is a period when the Chinese government faced declines and challenges, and specifically in around the uh, uh, 1890s, there had been a drastic increase in the Western sphere of influence in interior China, which gave rise to the Chinese nationalism. Uh, the manifestation of the lineage and the effort to win over the loyalty of scholars who are sympathetic to the Southern Ming may represent the government's desperate effort to rally the, um, to, to rally the country by emphasizing their shared national history and shared Confucian core um, in response to this newly recent nationalism and external crisis. Uh, specifically, the scroll reminds Han, Chinese, and Manchus of their shared beliefs and calls them to put aside their differences through the emphasis on succession of dynasty, the appeal to Confucian principles, and the neglect of the controversy concerning the Southern Ming regime, a source of internal conflict between the Man and Han ethnic Chinese. Hence, I dated those scrolls to either 1890s or um, early 1900s, concurrently or slightly after the emergence of Chinese nationalism. Thank you so much.
questions here. Um, and, you know, as I said, I'm not an expert in either of the topics, so um, if you have any questions um, on what they discuss. Um, Laura, could I ask you to contextualize that piece of music? Because, oh, I, I'd like you to contextualize that piece of music because there is much imperialistic music writing in the early 19th century. The Berlioz is a requiem after the French conquest in Algeria. Um, is, this, is this a sort of a strange one-off, or can you tell us about mm -hmm. other similar works that have been written during this period? Um, well, I can tell you that Leone Lee, the, the publishing house, published other works that were very much in the same vein. Um, and, and something that I cut from the spoken version of this paper, but was in the, the um, version on the project website, is that I mean, we don't really know that Keller composed this to celebrate the Treaty of Nanjing. He might have just had this sitting around as like a descriptive Fantasia band march for piano. And the publisher decided to slap the label, the Emperor of China's Band. I mean, we don't know. We don't know. And Keller is also a very shadowy figure. Um, it's hard to find out much, if anything, beyond the other pieces of music that he published. We don't even have dates for him. Um, so, so yes, it fits very much into a, a genre, a larger genre of music. Um, you know, the descriptive piano fantasia was, was such a large genre as well. And um, the kind of epitome of that was this work called The Battle of Prague, which actually did get um, performed on the concert stage. But so, so this whole idea of depicting a battle through piano music, you know, and that's related to Beethoven and Wellington's victory, um, and all, all that sort of thread in music composition at the time. So I, I think it's very deeply intertwined with that whole strain of music writing, which is infused with either nationalism or sort of a nationalism meets exoticism um, perspective, and those are both you know, dominant tropes in 19th century music writing. Yeah. I have a question about the coins. Uh, is the conceit of this catalog that the, these coins actually exist and that someone physically owns them and they're a record of coins that the author of the catalog has actually seen or touched, or is it sort of a artist rendition of here's what it would look like if it existed? Um, so I believe that this kind of coin catalog uh, had been, you know, modified from previous form of coin catalogs. For instance, in Siku Quan Shu, we can find uh, versions of coin catalog by Song Dynasty scholars, which is like seventh century earlier than um, than this coin scroll. So I believe that uh, first uh, they could just, uh, there, there might be somebody who have taken possession of some coins which they uh, illustrate this coin. And I think it is, um, it is more possible that they just copied from prior version of the coin catalogs and present this in this form. Because am I right in thinking this goes back to the time of Yao and Shun? And um, actually, so the time of Yao and Shun is definitely, um, so based on today's uh, uh, belief, it's definitely not accurate. Um, for instance, if I trace, trace this back, so for this Tang Yao Quan, this is actually a kind of spade spade coin casted in uh, Jing Guo in the Warring State period. Um, so, but Chinese scholar at that time, uh, you know, believe that it is created uh, in the period of Tang Yao or Yu Shun. And, and, I, and I noticed that there is a coin catalog in the late Qing era which says that some scholars believe that those coins are cast in Tang, Yao, Yu, Shun, and Xia Dynasty. However, we do not, accurate, we do not have accurate uh, document to testify that. Um, however, our scroll have limited uh, acknowledgement on that, and instead they just, like, I could say randomly assign those coins into dynasties to present uh, very holistic list of dynasty from the 
earliest one known according to Shangshu to the Ming Dynasty. So that's why I believe that this grow is not an academic coin catalog, but a statement of a continuity of the dynasties. Thank you. Sorry, I hijacked the mic. It's another question about the coin scroll. Um, it's a really interesting work, and I have a question about its viewership. It's not fine art exactly, but it was handmade, and it has English on it. Who was it made for? Can you talk about that? And could it possibly be that it was not made for uh, Chinese audiences in China? It's here in a brown collection. Might it have been made for foreigners studying Chinese? Okay. What do you think? Um, thanks for the question. So um, actually, I do not present this in Oh, but for instance, this is the Thai title of the one of the scrolls, and um, only the titles are in English, and all those characters, and, and for instance, uh, you can notice, um, uh, you can notice that there are some Chinese, you know, the uh, some, Chi some Chi Chinese notes about the coins, and all of those detailed notes are presented in Chinese and only the title is presented in English. So I personally believe that the intended audience of the scrolls are for Chinese since 99% are in Chinese. And if the, uh, in the intended audience is indeed uh, foreigners or English speakers, then um, this needs to be in, in English. And also, I believe that those scrolls might be used in the bilingual educational institutions at the end of the Qing Dynasty, where uh, at the very end of the Qing Dynasty, the government set up uh, many schools, and also uh, Western um, churches also um, set, set up educational institutions. So I think this is, it is very, very possible that those posters are for educational uses, since, as I've mentioned, the way of cataloging this point is um, not that uh, not that accurate or academic. I'm I'm so I'm I'm trying to tease through um, all the the really interesting information that you provided for us. I'm wondering though if another, so you have on the one hand this, um, uh, as you say, like the, the, uh, a lineage that's pre presented, a uh, chronology and a lineage. And then there are these anomalies in the chronology or lineage, the inclusion of the Southern Ming and so on. And then the absence of the Qing, which you can still include that dynasty, information from that dynasty, even though it hasn't concluded. So those to me all strike, strike me as sort of red flags or sort of questions, just quite things I want to know more about. Um, and then, so one other possibility that comes up in terms of audience is something that um, Dan mentioned actually is um, exhibitions. Um, and, you know, so this is the time of Colombian exhibition, exposition and so on. And that can be both foreign and domestic. So I'm thinking of, how Chinese religion was presented at those at these exp expositions, or you know, that it's it's partly packaging and con packaging uh, narrative about China for a, a domestic audience as part of presenting it globally. So that's one thing. Um, but then the other thing is, um, is this a statement of unity coming out from the? Dynasty, or is it actually an anti uh, someone who is anti Qing? Um, and I'm it, to me, it seems more maybe the latter, but I'm not sure. Um, okay, so my impression is that the audience is um, very um, is somewhat unlikely to to be uh, Westerners since. Um, for, for for instance, um, the two Chinese drum character here is just Yang Yi, which it's you know um, if uh, I, I I believe that if 
they were presented to Westerners, there won't be such accurate illustrations of the Jin Wen or the Zhuan Shu here presented um, in this spade coin. So those are all accurate illustrations of the characters used like 2,500 years ago in central China, China, which is the clan kingdom of Yan, Zhao, and Han, or the former Jin er area. Um, other examples may include Um, uh, for instance, I believe that this two character is Han Xin, or but but those are written in Chinese seal script, and those are all. Um, uh, so I compare those coins, uh, the, the the illustration of the coins to the illustration of the actual coins, and it turns out to be that it is accurately fit. So the seal script, or the Jinwen script written on the coin, is just what it had been appeared on the coins 2,500 years ago, and it's just the same with the coins in the Chinese museum. Um, so I believe that if they are to be presented to non-Chinese audience, they just don't need the effort to make all this pinyin or the pinyin. Uh, like those, 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 those characters to be correctly written. So that's my point. And concerning your question that whether this is the scroll um, created uh, by anti Qing individuals, I. Um, it's, it's actually a very good question. I haven't thought about this. Um, But since that, if I, I personally believe that if those if the scroll was produced by anti Qing individuals, then it might include more coins issued by the Southern Ming, since Southern Ming issues a lot of coins, um, and the coin of Great Ming is only one of them, and uh, and also there are also for for instance, Zhen Chenggong in Taiwan also issued perhaps some coins, I'm unsure about this, but if there are somebody who, 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 who creates this for anti team purpose, then I believe they will create it, they, they will insert not only one uh, Southern Ming coin where, where coins created by an anti team regimes. For instance, they will include coins uh, uh, casted by Taiping Tianguo, et cetera. Uh, I, I think you really need to seriously consider that this is a Western production for Western missionary port or treaty port audiences. Um, the fact that it has this little line about, well, the dates are probably not so accurate. The fact that it's using these, uh, the Romanization, why would, if this were a Chinese production for a Chinese audience, why would they have the Roman, English Romanization at all, right? And, it's, and you have to remember that there were lots of people in China at this time who were writing dictionaries, who were compiling all kinds of records of knowledge of China for, again, a, to be sure, not the sort of personal or, or you know, popular Western audience, but for a scholarly Western audience. And I think that it could fit that, but yeah. It's something you have in your essay, and you didn't talk about today. Um, but the, the last scroll in the Brown Collection that compares Chinese uh, characters to Egyptian um, hieroglyphics, that has the title in English and uh, some cross-cultural work going on, I think that's a, an important part of the context here. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if I don't want to gotcha you, but I, I think that there's a lot of a, a great dialogue here about the possible use. You've done a great job of bringing these questions up. The fact that it's so rich and we're talking about it, it's really wonderful, right? All right. This is actually a relatively simple comment, um, but I, I, I thought it in the context of thinking about where the project goes and how it might be developed in coming months and years. 
uh, Laura, it struck me that in your presentation you used the you suggested a kind of interweaving of a commercial mindset and an imperial mindset in this, and it seems like the discussion about the, the Da Qing, Wan Nian, Chen Tu was also very much about a sort of interweaving of imperial and commercial mindsets. And so if we're thinking about how these objects might be put in productive dialogue with one another as a sort of comparative heuristics to pull out what's distinct about the imperial mindsets and the commercial imperatives on, on both ends, this might be just a useful comparison to build on. But thank you very much for a wonderful yeah. presentation. Yeah, and thank you. Yeah, that's, if I could just briefly, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's exactly it. What struck me about this was, you know, as I learned more and more about the opium war, um, the first opium war, both of them, is, you know, of course, this was really driven by British economic um, impulses. You know, it, that was the driving force of fighting the war. And then you, so you, you sort of turn that around, repackage it for the home audience, and then you also profit from the British consumer base while you're also profiting in China. It's like the genius of capitalism, so to speak. <laughs> but yeah, that's exactly it. All right, I just have a quick question about the coin. So I know that uh, there was some omission of certain emperors on a certain dynasty of the coin, such as in the Ming dynasty, and also there was uh, the, the order of the emperors were not in the correct order as they appear chronologically. I just want to know if that was done purposely uh, for to pursue or to uh, portray a certain narrative, or is it done just because that they didn't arrange it in um, like a, a meticulous way? Thank you. Um, okay. So, so to be honestly, I haven't uh, considered this question and. It is very possible that they they just omit the, the, the issue concerning the, the, the sequences of the emperors, but uh, it is also indeed possible that uh, the uh, um, uh, the painter would like to deliver some information uh, by using this. Um, a not so quite correct, correct sequence of 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 the emperors. So um, I think I will look deeper into that. Great, thank you so much, and I think we're probably.